So, let's uh, let's talk some code. I uh, I won't be able to read your comments to me. I apologize. I'm uh, again. I'm trying to figure out how to how to make that happen. So I'll keep on playing with it, but uh, I'll check periodically. So introduction to the changes in the NEC, the 2020 version. Should you be interested? If not, uh, then by all means, feel free to leave. I'm Ryan. This is what I do for a living. That's my website, and that is my email address. So, and this is a big pimple on the head of a 40-year-old that still gets pimples. All right, the 2017 versus the 2020 NEC. So in the 2017 code, we had about 4,100 public inputs, and in the 2020, we only had about 3,700. So we had a few less proposals, a few fewer proposals. In the 2017, we had 1,500 public comments, but in the 2020, we had significantly more, which I found rather surprising. So uh, about 2,000 public comments. When the smoke cleared, it ended up being about the same number of changes, although I think there were more significant changes in the 2020. Uh, in the 2017 code, there were 19 code making panels, which has been the case for quite some time. Uh, in the 2020 code, it actually went down to 18 code making panels. Code making panel 6 and 7 were combined. Uh, off the top of my head, panel 6 used to cover Article 310 conductors and Article 402 uh, fixture wire and article 400 flexible cords, flexible cables. Uh, code making panel 7 covered the cable wiring methods, so AC cable, MC cable, NM, SE, UF, medium voltage cable, all of those things. They went ahead and combined those because they're, they're very similar. A lot of it has to do with the ampacity of conductors uh, and uses permitted, uses not permitted, the types of conductors, so it made sense to combine uh, code making panels 6 and 7. Of much more importance, code making panels 4 and 2 have fewer articles under their purview. Uh, panel 4 desperately needed that. Panel 4 was the solar people. So they had article 690 and 705, which is the, the PV and the interconnected uh, parallel power production sources. And that by itself is a massive amount of work. They also had uh, articles 225 and 230, which is buildings supplied by branch circuits or feeders, and also article 230 services. And quite frankly, it, it was too much. Uh, these guys were meeting for two straight weeks uh, and, and nonstop. And then you had code making panel 10, who only had article 240. That was it. Code making panel 10 had like 30 proposals. And that was it. So they're done in two hours. Panel 4 was done in two weeks. So panel 10 got Article 230, if I'm not mistaken. And I'm trying to remember what happened with panel 2. I don't recall off the top of my head. A, a real professional would have this figured out before he went on Facebook Live. But what it ended up doing is it allowed uh, for a lot of changes in Article 230. And indeed, that article probably got more changes than any. Uh, at least substantial changes. The process of changing the code, I think, is worth talking about. And, and I emphasize that it's an ANSI accredited code. So changing the NEC, it requires a multitude of things in order to be ANSI accredited. And what I found in my career, and I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, but the people that have the strongest feelings about the code change process seem to be those that don't know much about the process. The, the, the less you know about it, the more upset you get about it. That's been my experience. And, and the reason I say that is because, number one, it's an open process. It is not a pay-to-play endeavor. Anybody can make a public input. Anybody can make a public comment. All you need to do is create a username and password to nfpa.org. You don't have to be a member. You should be, but you don't have to be a member. Uh, you don't have to be anybody special. You can you can seriously be anybody. My, my kids could make proposals and comments. So it's an open process. Anybody can participate. Just as important, it's a transparent process. Everything that happens is with open doors. So you can go on to nfpa.org and you go to the 
now, uh, today is September 16th, you would go to NFPA.org, you would go to the NEC, I think that's NFPA.org slash 70, the NEC page, and you would click on the button that says Current Edition, and then you can scroll down, and you can read what's called the first draft report and the second draft report. You can read the tentative interim amendments. You can re read the results of the Standard Council's appeals. You can read everything that happened. Nothing happens behind closed doors. It's a transparent process. And that's obviously important. Just as important, and, and perhaps even the most important, is a balance of interest. So we have represented, I say we, uh, I'm not on a code making panel, I never have been, uh, but in the, I, I say we because I, I kind of feel like I, I'm a part, of, a part owner of the NEC, anybody that's involved in the process and, and feels strongly usually feels that way. So we have a maximum of one third of any interest group on a code making panel. Now we have to have manufacturers we have to have enforcement, we have to have labor, we have to have all of these things because they bring something unique to the table. It would be absurd to have a code making panel that regulates circuit breakers and fuses without the manufacturer of circuit breakers and fuses. Nobody knows circuit breakers and fuses better than the people who build them. So of course we have to have manufacturers on that panel, but it's a maximum of one-third. And that's combined of all manufacturers, not just one-third circuit breakers, one-third fuse makers, but a third of manufacturers, a third of, uh, of labor, right? Whether it's IBW or IEC or unaffiliated labor, uh, a maximum one-third of enforcement, maximum one-third of testing laboratories, so a maximum of one-third of any interest group. And then we have the, the concept of non-dominance. So a maximum of one-third from any interest and a minimum two-thirds vote to pass any changes. So we can't stack the deck. It's not like the manufacturers get together in a dark room and they're all smoking a cigar and they say, how, how can we screw the American public and, and make new rules for new products? That, that is not the way it works. It's simply not. It's a maximum one-third balance, balance of entrance and a minimum two-thirds vote to pass any requirement. We also have avenues for appeals. So if things didn't go the way you wanted them to, you can still appeal it. And the Supreme Court, if you will, of NFPA's code change process is what's called the Standards Appeal, uh, the Standards Council. And you can make appeals to the Standards Council and uh, sometimes they do pass. It, it's certainly not unheard of, it's not, it's not a waste of time. Uh, appeals get heard and appeals do pass. But probably the most important concept when it comes to changing the code is that it is an, a consensus standard. And that's something that I didn't really understand perfectly well until this year's code change process. It's a consensus standard. What that means is the technical committee and NFPA's membership have to agree on every word that goes into the code. Let me give you an example. There was a big to-do about AFCIs for the 2020 NEC. Somebody made a code change proposal, a public input, and said, hey, let's require AFCIs throughout the entire house. That went to Code Making Panel 2, because that's who Article uh, 210 covers. And Code Making Panel 2 said, no, we don't want AFCIs throughout the whole house. So they voted on it. It did not get two-thirds vote, so it was rejected. Somebody made a public comment and said, hey, we think that it should have passed. And Code Making Panel 2 said, okay, well, we'll revisit it. They revisited it and they said, no, it's not going to pass. We're not getting two-thirds votes, so no, it doesn't pass. Now, at the NFPA annual meeting, you can make what's called a, a, a floor action, basically. A, a, a make a motion from the floor to change the vote of the technical committee. So in other words, somebody came up and said, hey, listen, we're the membership of NFPA. We disagree with what the code making panel did. So we think AFCI should be issued throughout the entire house. And they took a vote. And rather surprisingly, I thought it passed. So the membership of NFPA actually said, no, we want AFCIs throughout the entire house. 
Okay, well now we do not have a consensus. Remember I said that the technical committee and the membership have to agree? So that means it went back to the committee. Code making panel two said, listen, the membership wants AFCIs throughout the house. So we need to revisit this one more time. Do we agree? Do we want them throughout the house? They took a vote again, it did not pass. So we did not have consensus. You have to have consensus on every word in the code. So because we didn't get consensus in 2020, that means it goes back to whatever the last consensus was. And that was in 2017, right? In 2017, the membership and the technical committee agreed on the language in, in 210.12a. So that's what remains in the 2020 code. So that did not pass. Now, getting into the actual changes, we have four new articles, but we also deleted four articles. So it ended up kind of being a wash. The new articles are Article 242, Over Voltage Protection, Article 311, Medium Voltage Conductors and Cables, 337, Type P Cable, and Article 805, Communication Circuits. And, and 805, yeah, that's the new article. There was no 805 before, but in actuality, it's actually Article 800 that's the new article. 805 covers what 800 used to cover. We deleted Article 280, Surge Arresters. We deleted Article 285, Surge Protection Devices. We deleted Article 328, Medium Voltage Cable. And we deleted Article 553, Floating Buildings. And we'll talk about all of those as we go. So looking at some of the changes here. Chapter 1, General, Article 100, Definitions. The applicability of the definitions in individual articles was clarified, which was great. And definitions specific to hazardous locations are now all in a new Part 3 of Article 100. Several definitions were relocated to Article 100 from other articles as well. Okay, so when we look at Article 100, Article 100 does not contain commonly defined terms unless they have a different definition than would be found in a typical dictionary. So uh, a common example of that is exposed. What does exposed mean? Well, in the NEC, exposed basically means that it's not concealed, <laughs> which, you know, kind of, duh, but concealed means that it's like behind drywall, it's permanently closed in. So is wiring above a suspended ceiling exposed? Yes. It doesn't matter that you can't see it, okay? So it's a different definition than the typical dictionary definition. Nobody using a typical Merriam-Webster would say that the wiring above a suspended ceiling is exposed. But using the NEC definition, we would find that it is exposed. Moving on with rare exception, term used, terms used in more than one article of the code are defined in Article 100. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, there are exceptions. So if I want to look for the definition of PVC conduit, for example, I would go to 352.2. And here's why we have this new note here. Definitions are also found in the dot two section of some articles. So if I'm looking for the definition of ampacity, well, that's used throughout the code. So I would go to Article 100. If I'm looking for the definition of, I'm trying to think of a good example, tap conductor, well, tap conductor is unique to Article 240, so we define that in 240.2. But there are some exceptions to that. The wiring methods are all defined in their Chapter 3.2 sections, PVC conduit in uh, 352.2, EMT 358.2. The weird, odd exception to that is multi-outlet assembly, which should be defined in 380.2. It's actually found in Article 100. Part 1 of Article 100 contains terms used throughout the code. Part 2 is for equipment over 1,000 volts. And new to the 2020 edition, and I, I love this change in principle. Part 3 contains definitions for hazardous locations. I love that we relocated all of the hazardous locations definitions and put them into a new part in Part 3 of Article 100. Here's what I don't like, and I, I didn't know this until I actually got my hands on the code book, and you're going to hate this too. What you're going to find is you're looking for a definition, and you're going to you're gonna find like you're in the letter I, and you're looking for, I, I don't know, identified. And you're in the letter I, and it's like, what happened to the definition of identified? There's hermetically sealed, and then there's increased safety, and there's no identified. It's because you're in part three. 
So it's really easy to screw up and find yourself in the wrong part of Article 100. And then you go to Part 1 and you're reading the stuff that we expect to find and you're like, well, where's the definition of explosion proof? And you got to flip back a few pages. So I, I think the idea is great. It's going to take some getting used to. It's easy to screw up. So be careful when you're using the new codebook. The only definition I'm going to hit is a new definition for reconditioned. Uh, boy, you want to talk about opening Pandora's box. In the 2017 code, we added language about reconditioned equipment. We added an informational note in 110.3A1, I think. And then we also added labeling requirements in 110.21C. And the floodgates opened. So now we are covering reconditioned in every way, shape, and form, starting with a new definition. It's electromechanical systems, apparatus, equipment, or components that are restored to operating conditions. It does not include on-site servicing and maintenance. So let's read this again carefully this time. Electromechanical systems, apparatus, equipment, or components. Okay, so electrical stuff that's restored to operating conditions. That means it was broken, right? It wasn't working before. You can't restore it if it was working. Restoring means, or excuse me, uh, uh, reconditioned means that it was not working and then you reconditioned it and now it is working. So doing little maintenance and stuff is not reconditioning. It didn't work. We ripped the guts out of it and we replaced it and now it works. That's reconditioning. It doesn't include on-site servicing and maintenance. This is the power plant where I teach every year. They, uh, they have all sorts of medium voltage circuit breakers. These are like uh, uh, 12,000 volt circuit breakers. And they have people come in all the time, once a year, and they test them and they make sure they work and they lubricate them. They, they do whatever type of maintenance is required. That is not reconditioning. Reconditioning means that it wasn't working. You almost always would take it off site rip it apart, replace it with new stuff, and make it functioning once again. There's also a note that they added saying the terms rebuilt, refurbished, and remanufactured are synonymous with reconditioning. So if my circuit breaker is rebuilt, refurbished, or remanufactured, that all means the same thing. That means it's reconditioned. And I also kind of noted that here on my sticker, tested, inspected, overhauled, these terms are not synonymous with reconditioned. All right, I know to check my internet here and just see if I have any comments. All right, looks like my Facebook feed is blowing up. <laughs> so I'm going to see if I have any comments just in case something unexpected happens. I'm going to move this. I've learned years ago not to show the internet live because you get all sorts of weird things. Is this real life? Pimples? Yes. Working, Inspector Rick, yo. Somebody's insulted. Somebody's laughing. Thanks. Okay, like it. Good. Okay, cool. So, looks like we're all good. Let's keep rolling. Article 110, general requirements. This is more of the reconditioning issue. And by the way, the whole reconditioning thing, um, what is reconditioning and what's not reconditioning? That's that's really what, what opened Pandora, Pandora's box here. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, you had all these houses that were underwater. And all of these electricians were, of course, uh, they, they went down there to make everything safe and help everybody, you know, and do the right thing, right? It wasn't possibly to get any of that good FEMA money, right? So anyway, they went down to all these houses that were underwater, and they ripped out the panel boards, rewired the houses, made the world safe once again, and then they had all of these circuit breakers and panel boards and things that were sitting in the back of the truck, and what do you suppose they did with those circuit breakers that were underwater for three months? <laughs> think they threw them away? No, oh, man, they put them on eBay. Right, sprayed them off with a hose, hit them with some compressed air, maybe you know, dry them off with a washcloth, and sold them as reconditioned. Okay, well, that's not reconditioning, man. Reconditioning means it was broken, you changed it all out, and then you repurposed it and made it working again. So, we made this change in the 2017 code to kind of address reconditioning, and then it, it really blew up because there was an informational note that that kind of said, hey, yeah, equipment can be reconditioned. And then it's like, well, 
wait a minute, there's some stuff that actually cannot be reconditioned. Molded case circuit breakers, like we all have in our own in our houses and in most commercial buildings, you're not supposed to recondition a molded case circuit breaker. They're they're sealed. You're not even, you're not supposed to open them. You know, if you break the seal, you, man, you're supposed to throw it away if it stops working. You're not supposed to recondition molded case circuit breakers. And there's other things that you're not supposed to recondition. We don't recondition fire pump controllers. You know, so there's certain things that we can and certain things that we can't recondition. And, and that was a big emphasis here in the 2020 code. So here the marking section that we talked about earlier was revised about reconditioning. So reconditioning equipment must be marked to indicate the party responsible for the reconditioning and the date that it occurred. It must also be identified as reconditioned and the original listing mark must be removed. Okay, so again, I don't have any great pictures of reconditioned equipment. So this was actually on-site uh, maintenance. But if this was reconditioned, then they would have to state that fact that it was reconditioned. They would have to have the label, the mark of the party that did the reconditioning. And then here's what's important. The original listing mark must be removed. If this thing was listed before by UL or Intertech or whoever, is it really still the same product that they certified once I rip it apart and replace all the guts and put it back together? You can see where the original manufacturer is saying, hey, <laughs> that, that, that's not what we sold. And UL and Intertech and Met Labs and everybody, they're like, hey, that's not what we certified. You know, so if you want to recondition equipment, that's fine. Mark it saying that it's been reconditioned and remove the listing mark because it's no longer the, the product that they certified. Now there's an exception and this is rather hard to wrap your head around. These new markings that we're talking about are not required in industrial facilities where only qualified persons service the equipment if the reconditioning is performed by the owner or operator as part of a regular maintenance program. Okay, so let's be careful here. Regular maintenance is not reconditioning, right? Reconditioning means it was broken and then you ripped out the guts and replaced the guts and you're making it work again. So reconditioning as part of a regular maintenance program, I, I, I that's almost uh, it's almost a contradiction in terms because again is regular maintenance fixing things that are broken because that's what reconditioning is so this uh, this exception is is rather hard to wrap your head around there's a couple of informational notes that are worth talking about the first one industry standards exist for reconditioned equipment and probably the most uh, the most common industry standard and it's an ANSI accredited standard is the one published by Pearl, the Professional Electrical Apparatus Reconditioning League. Uh, they do have an ANSI accredited standard and it talks about reconditioning. Uh, the next note, uh, which is basically what we just talked about with the definition, says that reconditioned is interchangeable with rebuilt, refurbished, and remanufactured. And then number three, the original listing mark may include the mark of the certifying body and not the entire equipment label. And, and you know, I, I, I made this, uh, this graphic look as ghetto as possible by design. I, I, all, all we're trying to do here is we're saying, look, man, it, it's, not, it's no longer certified by Intertech or UL or whoever did the certifying. I'm not going to remove all of the information from it. I'm still going to leave the label you know, who the manufacturer is, what's the voltage rating, uh, assuming that I didn't change any of that. But what I am going to have to do is I'm going to have to remove the certifying body's stamp, the, the listing mark. All right, getting into Chapter 2. Article 240, Overcurrent Protection. Still talking about this reconditioned issue, and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna give it a rest. 240.88, the application of reconditioned circuit breakers and components are now addressed. Now, we did reconditioned, re reconditioning changes throughout the NEC. Uh, Article 240 is probably the biggest. We also did it in 408 for panel boards, and then we have a list of things that can or cannot be reconditioned. You can't recondition uh, GFCIs, AFCIs, GFPE, receptacles, luminaires, fire pumps, uh, 
emergency system transfer switches. So throughout the code, we added lists of things that can and cannot be reconditioned. And here's the, the first example. 240.88 says reconditioned equipment must be listed as reconditioned. And again, the original listing mark must be removed. Don't read this too quickly and gloss over it now. It has to be listed as reconditioned. Not marked, not identified, not approved. It has to be listed. So if you're reconditioning circuit breakers, you can recondition it, but it has to be listed, which means you're going to send it off to UL, Intertech, Met Labs, whoever, or you're going to become, uh, I, I don't know what the name is, like an approved shop, you know, a, a place where where UL and Intertech and them, where they come to you, I think it's like four times per year, that they come in and, and do surprise visits and make sure that you're, that you're doing things right. So reconditioned equipment now for circuit breakers, they have to be listed. Now that's interesting because circuit breakers don't have to be listed, right? Generally speaking, circuit breakers don't have to be listed. But if you recondition them, they do. Now this is something that I only caught last week and it's very subtle. But if you're following along, I want you to note that 240.88 is in part, I think it's part 7 of Article 240. And Article 240, I think, has like 10 parts. And if you're careful, you'll find that, you know, part 1 is general, part 2 is like location in the circuit, and then you get into like fuses and fuse holders and, and plug-based fuses and circuit breakers. Where I'm going with, with this is this. Um, we're in circuit breakers. The next part of Article 240 is supervised industrial locations, and that's where we get some leniency on tap rules and things. And then the last part in Article 240 is for over a thousand volts. Nothing in those first seven or eight parts of Article 240 applies to over a thousand volts. And, and it couldn't. I mean, think about it. Like, you know, it's got to be readily accessible, really. The, a fuse up on an overhead trent, you know, that has to be readily accessible. So once you get over 1,000 volts, the rules are actually very, very minimal in Article 240. And this stuff does not apply to over 1,000 volts. And by the way, that was a mistake in the 2020, but you know, humans are involved, humans make mistakes. Okay, molded case circuit breakers are not allowed to be reconditioned. They are a sealed unit. They're not intended to be opened and ripped apart. Number two, low and medium voltage power circuit breakers may be reconditioned. Okay, so here is, if you've never seen one, this is a, a medium voltage power circuit breaker. This is one that you would rack in. This is like a, a 12,000 volt circuit breaker. So these can be reconditioned. Now I'm going to go back two slides. According to this, it has to be listed. But remember, this is not in the right part of Article 240. Why are we talking about medium voltage? Medium voltage is over 1,000 volts, right? Over 1,000 volts is not in this part of Article 240. It's in the last part. Same thing here. High voltage circuit breakers may be reconditioned. You know, there really is no rule for high voltage circuit breaker reconditioning because they put this in the wrong part of Article 240. It happens. We'll fix it in 2023. Components. Low voltage power circuit breaker electronic trip units may not be reconditioned. Uh, yeah, I, I can't get in here and recondition the trip setting. Number two, electromechanical protective relays and current transformers may. I don't have a photograph in, of an electromechanical protective relay. They, uh, I, I'm not lying, they, they are as intricate as a Swiss clock, and they look like one. Uh, little tiny gears and everything else. Um, if you have one, send me an email. But uh, those can be reconditioned. Okay, we're going to get off the reconditioning kick, and we'll go to the first new article that we added, which is Article 242, Over Voltage Protection. So we added this article by deleting two others. Article 280, Surge Arresters and Article 285 search protective devices were merged and relocated to a new Article 242. All right, so there you go. 242 over voltage protection, because that's really what surge protection is, right? The article covers uh, over voltage protection devices, including SPDs, surge protection devices, 1,000 volts and less, that's this guy here on the left, as well as surge arresters over 1,000 volts here on the right. So what used to be in Article 285 and 280 are now in Article 242. 
Uh, no real changes in Article 242, though. Chapter 3, Wiring Methods and Materials, Article 310, Conductors for General Wiring. I love what they did in Article 310. Everything about this was just awesome. The article was completely rewritten for ease of use, and its scope was reduced to address only 2,000 volts and less. Okay, so let's talk about that. 2,000 volts and... Well, let's, let's read the scope. The article covers conductors rated 2,000 volts and less, including their types, insulations, markings, ampacities, and use. Doesn't apply to conductors that are part of uh, equipment, such as motors and similar. Okay. If you've used the code for a while now, you might agree with me that Article 310 needed to be re redone. It needed to be rewritten. Um, some of the things that drove me crazy was like, you had, you had 15 tables in the back of Article 310. And you would read up to 310.15. It was all text. And then you'd get into this string of tables. And you, you'd never used any of them, right? You, the most any normal, typical electrician would ever use is two tables, but you had 15 of them. And then here was what I hated. After all these tables, you had like three paragraphs that actually had rules. And if you didn't know those were there, you never would have found them. We also added the dwelling unit table back in. So what we used to know and love as table 310.15b6 and then 310.15b7 before the 83% nonsense. The 83% nonsense is still there, but we added the table back. We, uh, it was in Annex D, example D7, and uh, you know if it's worth having anywhere in the code, then it's worth having in the rule, right? It's either a valid table or it's not. So if it's worth having as an example in the back of the code, then it's worth using in, in 310. The other thing that they changed is by limiting this article to 2,000 volts and less, most of those tables are gone, right? Most of those tables applied to over 2,000 volts. So those are gone. And then they rewrote, they clever, cleverly renumbered the article and ultimately made it so that table 310.15b16 is now once again, table 310.16, which was like a personal little win for me because back in 2011, I was the only person that made a comment saying, please don't change 310.16 to 310.15b16. So now it's back to 310.16, so that's nice. So nothing in Article 310 is gonna change your life, uh, but it's a definitely a big improvement in usability. Second new article, Article 311, medium voltage conductors and cables. New article was created for medium voltage conductors and cables. So there you go. These, these big dudes, they're in Article 311. Part of doing this also was the removal of Article 332, which was medium voltage cables. So the rules for medium voltage conductors and cables are now in Article 311. The third article that we added is Article 337, Type P Cable. A new article for Type P was created. Now, I don't have a photograph of this, and I would love it if you did and you emailed it to me, but let's be honest, uh, very few people do because this is an ultra-specialized cable. The only place you're going to find this is on a drill rig. This stuff is bulletproof. It's designed to have the Phoenix sun beating on it and the North Dakota snow laying on it and the tractors driving on it. They use it onshore, offshore, salt water. This stuff is just, I mean, it, it, it is like, it's made out of Kevlar more or less. And you can see it, it comes in all sorts of different flavors. Most of it has like a cable, a, a copper or aluminum braid, you know, like a, a sheath over it and then a thick insulation like a type uh, SEOW, you know, extra hard usage type of uh, jacket over it. So I don't know what this stuff costs, probably 20 bucks a foot. You know, uh, it's not something you're gonna wire your basement in. So when you read Article 337, you might notice that there's really not very many rules. It's like, well, where is the securing and supporting? Where's the uses permitted and not permitted in the app? Look, man. This stuff is designed to be thrown on the ground and left there for 10 years while tanks and everything else are driving on it, and it is fine. It's, it's 10 years later, it looks just like it did coming off the sales floor. So that's Article 337. If you've seen it, lucky you. Most of us never have and never will. 
getting into Chapter 5, Article 555, Marinas, Boat Yards, and now Floating Buildings, as well as commercial and non-commercial docking facilities. You might remember I said that we deleted Article 553, which is Floating Buildings. We incorporated it here into Article 555, and why not? Most of 553 uh, is repetition of what was in Article 555, and a lot of people don't know what a floating building is. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, I live in the desert. We don't get a lot of floating buildings. And once you figure out that it's like, you know, it's a building that's basically part of a marina or a boatyard, and the building floats on piers just like, uh, just like the boatyard and the dock, yeah, why not? You know, it makes sense to put it in Article 555. So the title, scope, and requirements were expanded to include floating buildings, and we also added a couple of informational notes. Now, I'm not going to read the entire scope of Article 555. I think it is the biggest scope. Uh, in the entire NEC, but you can see from the yellow underlined text that the change is we added article, we added floating buildings. We also added two informational notes. The first one reminds us that hazardous voltage and current may result when boats, floating buildings, and similar are connected to a source of electricity. I mean, a, kind of an obvious statement, but uh, there, there's far too many accidents. There, there's far too many injuries, and uh, and indeed deaths to to. You know, I, I don't want to poo-poo this issue. It, it's a real issue, you know. So you read this, and it's like, well, yeah, stupid, of course. Yeah, you know, water and electricity don't mix. You really need to say that? Well, yeah, we kind of do, man. It, it's a real issue. There's something called electric shock drowning, and it does happen, and it's horrible. Uh, if you have a boat, I'm going to do a little public service announcement. If you have a boat, if you have a swimming pool, I would buy this product right here. Uh, they don't pay me. They don't even know who I am. But uh, this is a little device. It's battery operated. You can just see the the side of it here. It's a uh, it's like a cube, and it's got it, like I said, it's battery operated, and it has at least a visual indicator. I don't know if it's audible, and it's got like a, a long lanyard, so you can tie it to your boat, you can tie it to the ladder in your swimming pool, and you throw it in the drink, and if it reads voltage in the water, the alarm goes off. And I know I probably sound like tinfoil hat guy, and those of you that know me know that that is really not how I operate. But this, this is a real issue. And if I had a boat or a swimming pool, I would have one of these. Also added an informational note saying, hey, material from NFPA 303, which is the standard for marinas and boat yards, and NFPA 307, the standard for the construction and fire protection of marine terminals, piers, and wharves is included here. Uh, Article 555 essentially got a rewrite. It's uh, substantially bigger than it was before and it needed to be. The issue of electric shock drowning is something that we're learning more and more about every day and it, uh, it warranted a rewrite of Article 555. Skipping all the way to Chapter 8, just about done here. Article 800, General Requirements for Communication Systems. New article. Article 800, now contains the general requirements for all of Chapter 8, and 805 covers what Article 800 previously covers. Okay, so when I go to 800, I'm going to get the general requirements for communication circuits, which used to be 800. Community antenna television and radio. hate that name, but it's basically coaxial cable using television signals. So, closed circuit TV, community antenna TV, any of those going over a uh, coaxial cable. And articles 830 and 840, network powered and premises powered broadband. If you've spent much time in chapter 8, you get this profound sense of deja vu as you read through the five articles that are in chapter 8. They all have uh, an 800.24 mechanical execution of work, and they all say the exact same thing. They all have a uh, 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 dot 90 primary protect dot 100 grounding electrode system and it just it just goes on and on and on and on and there's there's so much unique information between what used to be 800 and 820 830 840 there, there's very few rules that are actually specific most of it is general so they added an article 800 to cover the general stuff and I got to be honest I'm so glad they did this it's like our, it, it's like article 110 can you imagine if if we didn't have Article 110 to cover general rules, you know? And like every occupancy in Chapter 5 copied Article 110 
and pasted it in their article. That's what it used to be in Chapter 8. So now they've, they did a really nice job with it. The last thing is 805, just like I talked about. This article covers what 800 used to cover, minus the general requirements that are common to articles 805 through 840. So 805 covers communication circuits and equipment. So you're going to have requirements here for the cables in 805.179, uh, but you're not going to have, you know, mechanical execution of work, neat and workmanlike manner, fire stopping penetrations, that's general stuff it's covered in 800. The primary protector here in 800.90, that's unique, right? We don't have that in 820, so that's actually covered here in 805. With that said, thanks for watching. Hope you guys have a great night.